I'm Dr. Brad Hafford, archaeologist at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm here at the ancient city of Nimrud, Kalhu, which was the capital of the Assyrian Empire in the 9th and 8th centuries BCE. And I'm going to continue my series about how the archaeological sausage is made, as they say. In this case, I'm going to talk about field recording. Now, I draw pretty much everything on an archaeological excavation because it really helps me to understand it. A lot of modern people, let's say, my students, etc., say, well, cameras can do all of this now. We can locate them with GPS and we can make sure that everything is exactly to a grid. And so, just have drones take pictures. We can even make 3D models of them from all the pictures that they take, and all of that is true, and it's very important. However, the old methods, they help too, in a way that many people don't quite understand. They say, well, this is faster with machines. Yes, in many cases it is. Of course, you have to take a lot of pictures, you have to process to make the models, and you're still doing a whole lot of work. But you're usually doing that afterwards, and we could do it back home, so we don't have to spend the time in the field to do it necessarily. But when you're physically looking at the objects or the architecture, you're more in touch with them. When I draw things, I'm actually looking at them very carefully in order to put them onto the page. And that helps me to think about how it was built what the ancients were doing when they actually put them in. I also take points on many of these things in order to check myself. So if I've got points from a total station, I can then correct my drawings. There are many techniques for drawing. Many people will fashion a kind of frame, a wooden frame that then has lines, strings, every 10 or 20 centimeters, and they'll put that down and that will help them to understand where their squares on their grid paper are and draw within that grid. Now that helps for a small area, but when you're working with a thing here, I'm drawing five meters by uh, three or four, it really doesn't help much. Um, and of course that frame has to be kept level. So do all of my lines. But what I do is I lay a baseline that's along a grid and that would be a long meter tape, and then a second grid line going the other direction, making sure that those are on heavy grid lines on my paper. And then I have to keep the scale in mind, and I have to know what each millimeter on the paper equals in the real world. Today, I'm drawing at an unusual scale, one to 25. I chose that last season when I started drawing because it would fit on my page and give me the most detail I could get. And it's not the best scale to draw at, but it works. And I've continued it because I'm in the same space. I need to join all of my drawings, and I do that digitally. I have found, of course, that as I draw each brick, sometimes I find that ones are inscribed that I didn't uh, realize before, or I can think about these strange clay knobs. We've now pulled one out. It's actually a plug that goes into a hole in the brick for some reason. We still don't understand what they were used for, but we know a little bit more about how they were laid in. But it does keep you constantly thinking. And even the people who say, well, I'm not an artist, I can't draw. You don't have to be an artist. What this is, is measuring points and putting that point onto a grid and sort of joining the dots, really. Um, I will be showing various uh, drawings throughout this video but um, I, my notebook always has millimeter graph paper on one side and then my notes on the other. And that millimeter graph paper is essential. It's rather hard to get in the US. I have to order these from Canada or from Europe. I will do a lot of filming of me doing some of this drawing and uh, try to do it time lapse kind of to show you uh, what's happening. Some people would call this type of work unnecessary in this day and age, but I still stand by it. Digital methods require power to charge batteries and often rely on internet connectivity. Here in Iraq, power frequently goes down and internet can be unreliable. Digital methods record only what can be seen when photos are taken. We clean surfaces as much as possible, but when drawing in person, I can brush more or examine carefully where I could not in a photo if that area was partly obscured. Physical methods are prone to human error, but 
Even though machines don't exactly make mistakes, they are prone to operator error as well and are only as good as their input data. So using a combination of methods to supplement each other is best. The line of this paved brick floor angles away from my grid and that makes it <laughs> pretty tough. You want these lines to be straight on your grid, uh, on your graph paper, but they aren't. So I have to draw them in as angled and I am adding a certain amount of error. This line is not perfectly horizontal level because the floor isn't, and I've laid it down on there. I could take a lot of time and put a line level and try to make sure that it's absolutely perfectly level, but this is gonna be good enough to help me observe, and then when it's corrected with the total station shots, I'm usually only maybe five centimeters out. That can expand over long distance though, you know, when I first begin, I'm, I'm dead on, and then maybe I start to introduce some error. So I try to check myself as much as possible, but even when there are those errors, you're still doing that observation, which I think is vital, and you've still got the exact shots. I could try to shoot every corner of every brick with a total station, or I could, well, right now, we, do, we still don't have a drone here, so we can't actually do the top-down drone shot that's geo-rectified. So I have to re resort to the old ways. Some of the younger people get a little too reliant on their machinery. And if that breaks down, then they can't seem to find a way to, to work. I'm not, I'm not trying to say all young students aren't any good. Of course they are, but they are often learning these new methods which are reliant on power, which we don't always have here, things go down, and on machinery that hopefully we've got in the field, but we can't always have. So these old methods are still valuable is all I'm saying, and uh, combining them is the ultimate. You, you really need to use all of the techniques that you can possibly get to make sure you're documenting everything as completely as you can. And this does take time. There's no doubt about that. If you don't have time, you do as good a sketch as you can and you take all of your shots. But right now, luckily this morning, I've got time to do this and I've been doing all of the floors, I've done the walls. I try to draw everything, at least in a sketch. Of course, I'm also running down all of the notes about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. I talk about the stratigraphy and about the architecture. And that's important because I'm the one that sees it here and if someone I don't know, has to publish my notes sometime. Hopefully they'll really know what I've done here. I've worked with a lot of legacy notes from Leonard Woolley and others, and it can be frustrating when they give you very little information and you want to try to reconstruct something and you just can't because they didn't tell you enough. Now, I'm probably not saying the right things sometimes either, and somebody will get my notes 50 years from now and go, what's he talking about? But I'm really trying to be conscious of <laughs> that someone may have to use them in the future. I'm doing this upper line of bricks now and you can see that my lines are sometimes rather sketchy and I've got fairly thick mortar lines, but they are relatively thick in there. Uh, so I, I do a kind of sketch and then I try to round it out, make sure my measurements are good. My actual grid line are these dots in here, and then those strange plugs or knobs or whatever they are, are down in here. Uh, that's the drawing aspect of this and note taking to some extent. I also often sketch some of the important finds and show them how they measure, etc. When I'm when I first get them out. As they get registered, we do more of those kinds of measurements. Uh, conservators look at them and they talk about condition and other things, so uh, many people will see them, but the field archaeologist is the person that sees it first and the one that sees it in context, the things that come out of here, the architecture, etc. It's our duty to make sure that this is recorded as well as possible. It really is our job. We're, we're not looking for gold. We're looking for information about how people lived and how they built their buildings, how they made their artifacts, and what they used them for. So that's why we're here.
and I hope you enjoyed seeing how we do some of the field recording. And I hope you'll join me again next time on Artifactually Speaking.